So Milgram was able to distill all these rules that we find whenever people blindly follow authority. And you see these rules played out the same way across place and time. And this is what we need to teach our children. So they know the signs to look for. So they know how not to get seduced into the trap. I mean, for God's sake, we teach all children how to do long division by hand and we teach them how to play soccer and how to watercolor. But why isn't it mandatory that we teach them lessons like this? Like how to know when they are getting manipulated, how easy it is to get manipulated, how to develop immunity against manipulation by simply knowing the signs to look for. That would be an education worth having. Okay, so the first thing we need is meaningful, universal education about these issues. The second thing we need is social modeling. So in the last episode, I talked about syndrome E, which is where your neural circuitry for caring about other people gets turned down or turned off and people act like psychopaths, performing actions like murdering mothers and their babies on camera things that would normally not even be thinkable or conscionable. And I spoke about it as though everyone in wartime can catch Syndrome E, or that everyone in Milgram's experiments showed inappropriate obedience to authority. But in fact, there are always heroes who stand up against authority. In Nazi Germany, for example, there was a group of students known as the White Rose. They put all their efforts into making and disseminating flyers and pamphlets against the actions of the Third Reich. Now, tragically, they were eventually captured and rounded up and they were all executed by the Nazis. But this is the kind of thing for us to teach our children about and keep their names alive, celebrating heroes who stand against authority when they see something going horribly wrong. And I'm not talking about just being a pain in the neck to authority because that's trivial and not always useful. I'm talking about seeing something that's actually really wrong. And even though it appears that all the adults know what they're doing and have good reasons and they're only asking you to do something small and they'll take the responsibility and so on, think about whether it's the kind of action you would want to take if you thought about it from your own first principles. Would you feel that it's conscionable to murder your neighbors and take their stuff? If the answer is no, then it should remain no, even if the world gets a little nutty. And this is where social modeling helps. We learn about heroes who stuck with their conscience. So if you know these stories, then the next time you find yourself in some situation, you've at least got a template that you can think about following. So number two is about teaching our children and ourselves about those who stand strongly against things that are asked of them in a time of war and madness. The third defense against dehumanization is clever social structuring. And I talked about this a few episodes ago about the Iroquois Native Americans who lived up around what's now upstate New York. And they're known as the League of Peace and Power, but they weren't always known as that, and certainly not 400 years ago. There used to be six tribes who were always fighting with one another, real bloody battles. But in the 1600s, they were brought together by a man who came to be known as the Great Peacemaker. He combined them into one nation. But by the way, combining people is not enough. It turns out that if you simply push people together, that can fall back apart easily. He did something more clever. He structured clans such that each tribe member ended up belonging to one of nine clans. So I might be a member of the Seneca tribe, but I'm a member of the Wolf Clan. And you're a member of the Mohawk tribe, but you're also a member of the Wolf Clan. And the key is that the membership to tribes and clans, these cross cut. And so how is the Seneca tribe going to fight against the Mohawk tribe when I'm a wolf and you're a wolf? And by the way, my Seneca friend is in the Hawk clan and your Mohawk friend is in the Hawk clan too. 
So when we all consider waging war, we think, I don't know, I got friends over there. I've got fellow clansmen in that tribe. So by cleverly structuring things in a society, by cultivating cross-cutting ties, you can tamp down people's natural vigor to make easy outgroups. You can complexify their allegiances. 